Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Nicolas Zingales. I'm a professor at FTV Law School in Rio de Janeiro and uh, coordinator of the My Data Brazil Hub. Uh, and it's a pleasure uh, today to welcome you to this session uh, on uh, My Data seen from a global perspective, in particular the global south. Um, so here we have with us uh, um, four excellent speakers that we invited to um, give a, per a perspective uh, on new developments uh, coming out from uh, uh, very different regions of the world. Um, so we will be able to hear uh, the presentation and then uh, have some time for Q&A and discuss a little bit the links and the uh, you know, possible uh, interaction between different initiatives. Um, so our first speaker is uh, Alison uh, Irwald, uh, who is the Executive Director of Research SP Africa. Um, she has done a lot of very relevant work in the area, uh, including uh, recently she was appointed um, to, to conduct the work on um, uh, data inequality um, uh, that maybe she can talk a little bit about and, and uh, Research SP Africa has been also at the forefront of the recent discussions of in the African Union uh, for uh, the uh, privacy um, for a new privacy framework. Uh, so well, um, I suggest that we start with a presentation by each of the speakers and I will introduce one by one uh, in considering also that not everybody is, is already uh, in the stage. Uh, but so that said, uh, Alison, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, thank you very much, and you have the floor for the presentation. Thank you very much, um, Nico, and um, very nice to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation, all. Um, I'm. Am I to share my screen, or is that presentation going to be um, displayed? Yes, please share your screen uh, and uh, note that from the backstage, we cannot uh, uh, talk anymore. So once you present, just go on. You can you can share your screen now. I will just acknowledge that it's OK. All right. Thank you so very much. It should be coming up now. Are you seeing this screen? Just give a second. We are not seeing it yet. It is still quite okay. funny. Okay, okay. <laughs> now we are seeing your screen <laughs> and you can, you can put it full screen. Perfect, I will duck out of the session. On you go, Alison, thank you very much. Thank you um, very much indeed. Um, I'm, I'm actually just uh, going to speak in the very short time we have as quickly as possible. Nico, please feel free to just Give me the heads up when I'm a minute away or something. Um, but I just wanted to share with you some really some highlights of the Africa Data Policy Framework, which was adopted by um, African Union member states uh, earlier this year um, and is now in the process of an implementation phase and a capacity building assessment phase, which I'll also speak about a little. Please do look at the um, uh, URL there, you look at the document online, it is available in the five African languages um, of the African Union, including Kiswahili, it's one of the first documents to be um, published in Kiswahili, um, which is very exciting considering the content of the, of the work. Um, the data policy framework is very much embedded in the African Union's um, 2020 digital transformation strategy, which is also a critical part of the African Union's agenda 2063, which is the very um, ambitious uh, pan-African strategic framework for unity, self-determination, freedom, progress, collective prosperity, um, and of achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, very broadly, it's a high-level principle document um, that is then intended to be taken forward in the implementation phase and the domestication phase at the national level by countries um, towards ultimate harmonization, but in the short term towards um, uh, um, 
uh, iterative uh, domestication that would allow for the progressive realization of these very ambitious um, goals. It sets out a common vision, principles and strategic priorities and some key recommendations to guide African Union member states in firstly developing the um, uh, national data systems in a more standardized way and thereby being able to integrate them together with the cap capabilities required to do so and the institutional capacity to do so to effectively derive value from data that is being generated by citizens in Africa, by government entities in Africa and by um, industries. So it really is an expansive document. It is dealing with non-personal and personal data. It builds on the Malabo Convention, the previous data policy and cybersecurity framework, but it's far more, um, uh, it's far broader in scope. And I suppose in many ways is trying to do some of the things that the European Union is now doing um, with, you know, building on the GDPR, with the Digital Services Act, um, it, it doesn't um, actually scope out those um, regulations in any way because the African Union doesn't have the same um, mechanisms to do so, but it is certainly um, driven by the African continental free trade area and the ambition to have a, a, a single market and particularly a single um, digital market. So it's really trying to forge a you know, common data policy, both personal and non-personal, so very large in scope, um, underpinned by a coherent governance approach, which will allow for the development of these integrated data systems, critical for interoperability, for ensuring that the information flows and production from digitalization and datafication, the value can be realized in Africa. It's... Um, basically developing, providing guidelines for the development of national data strategies that are both um, continentally interoperable, but of course, nationally aligned and nationally um, internationally um, operable. Um, and it's really very much, as I said, driven by the economic imperatives of the um, uh, agenda, uh, agenda 2063. Um, and the Continental Free Trade Agreement. And it's believed that if we get some of these fundamentals in place, we, it has the potential to unleash economic and social um, benefits. Um, very importantly, acknowledging that a lot of work has to be done for that to be realized and to prevent the harms and mitigate the risks that we know accompany that. Perhaps differently from some of the other data frameworks that are coming out at the moment, it's very concerned with the current and even distribution of opportunities and harms, both within countries, um, in, in African countries, but also between African countries and between African countries and, of course, the, 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 the dominant um, uh, countries or the dominant uh, um, technical com te technology companies that are operating in, in the bigger you know, um, uh, markets of the world. Um, and so it, there's a strong aspect of, of data justice in the document. It still, of course, has to be developed, but it's a core principle. Um, it is, you know, rights preserving. It's very important, but it extends these individualized privacy rights that have um, dominated data protection frameworks in the global north to looking at social and economic justice um, and ensuring that, um, you know, that the structural inequalities that are there are acknowledged and that the um, opportunities and benefits, you know, um, are for all on the continent and responsive um, to the voices of all of those currently experiencing inequalities. So I'm just going to speak, um, Nico, please stop me whenever we are, because it's a, it is a very comprehensive document. It is, um, you know, it, it looks at the um, economics of data and the you know, unequal outcomes currently of, of, of data and how you would need to redress those. It does look at the fundamental characteristics of data as a, um, you know, it's a digital public good and how in governance and in regulation that could be realized um, to ensure that um, there is a, a public good value, um, value of uh, valuation of data in addition to the um, commercial value data driven frameworks that are, are currently dominant and inform a lot of our policy and, and regulations. So there's quite a lot of emphasis on, on, on building public value, which of course in the African context um, with the very low levels of internet penetration um, and, 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 and digital technology take up, the, um, some of the biggest collective users and producers of data are of course um, government. So it's also about mobilizing that, that value 
for you know multiple purposes for planning for sharing research for enabling um, startups and operators to um, have access better access to quality data so um, essentially the framework is about creating this enabling environment for for data unlike some of the other data policy frameworks which have assumptions around certain you know, political economies um, about, around markets it has a very important section, although it's not obviously the main data section, around the foundational infrastructure that is going to be required for any of this, um, these visions um, to be realized of a, you know, the transformative potential of data. And in the in foundational infrastructure, we're looking both at digital infrastructure, broadband infrastructure, but also the you know, new data infrastructure is, that's required. And that includes the institutional arrangements in order to um, assure, ensure um, equitable and innovative participation. And then another critical element of this, of course, um, is uh, the digital um, ID, digital identity infrastructure that's required for people to, you know, to participate uh, meaningfully, and which has a whole lot of potential, but of course, a considerable um, set of harms that are already being witnessed where biometric and digital IDs are being established. And then there is a section on the digital markets, and basically data value, and looking at um, you know the, the extractive nature of data um, value at the moment and value creation, um, but also understanding that you know data has no value in and of itself. It has to be processed. It has to flow, um, and it's about optimizing the opportunities for it to do so. It emphasizes, as I said, public value, but also the important cross-sectoral nature that this can no longer be you know allocated to a sectoral silo for development, as it has tended to be. Um, in many jurisdictions, and that the cross-sectoral implications of this are for, you know, tax policy, trade policy, competition policy, and the need for um, coordination, jurisdictional um, uh, coordination, not only at the national level, but also at the um, cross-border cross and at the you know, continental level. And then there's an important section on setting up the trustworthy and legitimate um, data framework for the continent. And I think that's been an important discussion in terms of taking um, notions of, of, of trust beyond those of simply security and data protection. You know, if we've got data protection in place, if we've got a safe and secure, you know, cyber secure environment, um, that will produce the trust that people will require to use um, uh, to, to use these data services. And we see you know, the issues around um, surveillance, if people don't trust the state, the fact that that's in place doesn't help. If people don't distract, um, trust commercial operators because of the extractive nature of, of the, their use of data, that doesn't create it. So it, you know, it's attached to rights, it's attached to ethics, but it's attached to um, you know, innovation and cybersecurity, but it requires a level of legitimacy. And that might be in democratic countries, you know, sort of democratic rule of law kind of issues. We know of a number of benign um, authoritarian states, not only in Africa, um, that are um, you know, trusted by their citizens despite not having some of those things in place. But, we, but what we argue is that in terms of the continent, these are the critical requirements. And the others are more technical data integrated system. I'll just end off now, Nico, thank you very much. Just to draw your attention to the data governance section, which hopefully we can get into some discussions in the past, in, in the, as we discuss, because in the past, this has been quite narrowly focused on data sovereignty and data localization and those kinds of things. And so it looks at this in terms of, you know, harms and opportunities in a very broader way. Sorry to run over a little. No, thank you very much. It's a, it's a fantastic document and uh, initiative. And we would like to hear much more, but unfortunately, the time, uh, the very limited time is constraining us. I, I would just like to ask then a clarification. I understand that this uh, policy framework um, is an attempt by the African Union to coordinate the initiatives at the regional level and that there is no binding, uh, at the moment, no binding uh, value in what has been adopted. Um, so, and then the initiative will fall on the, on the states to actually follow on with the proper uh, steps. Uh, or potentially also private entities involved. So uh, could, you, could you perhaps just clarify that, the value of this in terms of how it's going to be implemented? Thank you very much, Nico. You're absolutely correct in the sense that this is, is not a convention, as the Malabo Convention is, for example. Um, but I think what is significant about this document is that it has now been adopted by member states. It is not going the same process. So 
Many of you will know that although um, Malabo was, um, you know, um, adopted by states maybe 10 years ago, eight, 10 years ago now, um, it still has not reached the 15 only of the 55 member states. It's a, it has still not met the 15 to ratify it for it to become, you know, an um, uh, obligation on, on states. Many states are still doing it, even if they haven't ratified it parts of it. But basically, you know, what is pointed out in the framework is that the Malabo Convention is now, you know, rather out of date a, a decade on and would actually even require updating, but that countries are urged to proceed with that because that's obviously a basis to, to build on this. But you're absolutely right. The, um, the agreement is essentially a guiding framework for member states who are, um, you know, a, to guide them in the domestication of this data framework. And as I said, there are a lot of incentives for African countries because of the African continental free trade area um, and the you know, potential of them being more equitably drawn into a, a single data market. And also the realization that unless they do um, you know, implement, address, adopt some of these things, they are not going to be able to compete um, you know, equally or, you know, benefit or enjoy the same benefits as, as other African countries that are geared to use the um, continental free trade area in order to, um, you know, to economic reconstruction now post-COVID, but even before COVID, um, to achieve the SDGs and economic um, development. Very interesting. Um, so I, I think this is also food for thought in our conversation here because is a framework that goes beyond simply uh, data protection and privacy. It has a much broader focus on uh, data governance and digital transformation even, and how can institutions keep up with uh, uh, the changes that are needed uh, in this uh, new data-driven society. So thank you very much. I know maybe we come back uh, to that for some discussion towards the end. But now I'll move on to the, our second speaker, uh, which is uh, Luca Belli. Uh, he's, uh, my colleague here at, at the law of internet governance and regulation here, and he uh, was uh, director of the Center for Technology Society, uh, who is here, and the Cyberbricks project. Uh, we will also have another speaker from the Cyberbricks project later on, uh, but uh, I think that Luca will tell us a little bit more about uh, the development in the BRICS regions and with regard to personal data and data governance, and perhaps also branch into some uh, regional LATAM issues. Uh, so, look at as you as we heard yesterday, and uh, unfortunately, we only have six minutes. Thank you very much, Nico. Thank you very much, Nico, and thank you very much to uh, my data friends for having organized this uh, this meeting. Uh, it's very good to be with you and. Uh, just to be brief and, and concise, uh, I will. Uh, I, I really want to drive you through the updates in the BRICS grouping uh, with regard to data protection and data governance. And actually, it's very. It's not really easy to speak about BRICS because it's not really a, a region uh, like the African continent. It's really a heterogeneous uh, grouping. So I would like to just spend a couple of minutes uh, to to. Share with you a little bit of. Let me just see if you can. If you can see this, can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? I cannot hear anyone say confirming if you are seeing my screen or not. And I cannot see anything it's fine else. it's fine yeah it's yeah, fine thanks. it's fine Excellent. perfect perfect thank you very much uh, so yeah to uh, briefly drive uh, walk you through uh, the BRICS evolutions so i will uh, avoid mentioning uh, too much too many information too much information about uh, fgv where i work which is uh, the main academic institution uh, in brazil and one of the uh, most impactful think tank in the world, currently the third uh, out of 11,000. Uh, as Nico was mentioning, it coordinates the Center for Technology and Society at FGV. And the research I'm going to present has been produced by the CyberBricks project that I direct since uh, four years here at FGV. And uh, all the information I'm going to mention are on, on 
free access on our website, cyberbricks.info, well, the website, the dedicated website of the project. And so the first question is why, uh, what are the BRICS and uh, why are they relevant? Well, BRICS is the acronym of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And they are particularly relevant because uh, for several reasons. One is, the first one obviously is they encompass 3.2 billion of the world population and half of the internet population, more than 2 billion uh, connected individual. So if individuals produce personal data, when we speak about personal data governance, we really have to uh, be mindful of what this grouping uh, of countries is elaborating in terms of data policies, because it will impact, it's already impacting uh, almost half of the world population and half of the online population, and will increasingly impact all the individuals, corporations, countries that interact and, uh, with these countries and use the technology they produce. Uh, and increasingly, the grouping is also going to expand. Uh, only a couple of months ago, Argentina and Iran uh, formally requested to accede to this uh, grouping. Other countries like Turkey, Egypt are also, other large developing countries are uh, also trying to accede to the grouping. And indeed, the best way to see the uh, BRICS is, a lot of, is a sort of, like a sort of G7 of the developing world, of the emerging economy. It's not a G7, it's a G5. Uh, and then there is, there will be, it will be likely be expanded over the next couple of years. But the, the goal of the BRICS has never been to copy and paste what others uh, do. As former uh, president of Brazil, Lula, and front runner on the next coming elections that we will have here in Brazil on, on Sunday was tellingly stating the BRICS is not about coping the others, is to do things differently in order to be independent, to create institutions that allow also the emerging world to have voice. Uh, and where do the, the digital policies fit into the BRICS uh, uh, agenda? Well, starting from 2013 with the Snowden revelations, one of the presidents of the uh, one of the leaders of the BRICS, uh, President, uh, former President Rousseff, was herself illegally wiretapped. And therefore, data security, ICT security, and data privacy were uh, vehemently introduced into the agenda of the BRICS countries. Let's remember that, um, that Brazil adopted the Marcos Avila Intermatch and then started a new consultation to the then uh, ended up with the adoption of the current new general data protection law, the LGPD in Brazil. In, at that time in Brazil, uh, sorry, in, uh, in um, South Africa with the Itaquini uh, uh, declaration, the BRICS grouping for the first time included the need to work together to, for joint uh, shared norms on data sec information security at the international level. And since then, they've started a sort of synergy that is not based on traditional uh, tools of cooperation like treaties, hard law, but is rather based on a, a different way of cooperating and, and, and uh, coordinating. Uh, first, they started a working group to share information about ICT governance, the working group on ICT security. Then they created a memorandum of understanding to uh, develop joint research project, and then they created a New Development Bank, that is the only uh, BRICS-led institution created in 2014 that aimed at financing ambitious projects, including new digital infrastructure projects. So it's a very different way of uh, coordinating, uh, cooperating. And this is what in internet governance uh, jargon is called enhanced cooperation. So a way of coordinating digital policies uh, within a, a small group of countries even if uh, this group of countries was lacking a formal treaty of cooperation, but was increasingly enhancing cooperation. Actually, this is what they explicitly also tell in the declarations of the uh, ICT ministers since they have been created in 2015. Uh, so here you see, for instance, a fragment of the 2020 declaration where they state their uh, willingness to engage in, in, in uh, further cooperation, especially in the area of data, of personal data protection, cybersecurity, and uh, the need to work together on, on cybersecurity and data protection was indeed highlighted since the Xiamen Declaration in 2017. Uh, and then since that moment, they have started to uh, 
radically reshape their data governance frameworks. Uh, if you want to know in detail how data protection is regulated in the BRICS countries, you can check this interactive tool on cyberbricks.info about data protection in the BRICS. And also you will find this uh, freshly released paper that will be published next week by the Oxford University Press uh, International Data Privacy Law Journal about data protection in the BRICS countries, uh, legal interoperability through innovative practice and convergence. So let me share a couple of the findings here to uh, wrap up in a couple, in the couple of minutes that I still have. Uh, so what are the major advancements at the uh, at the BRICS level? So first, if we start with Brazil, we have, a, as I was mentioning, a new general protection law, a new authority, and also the enshrinement of data protection as a new fundamental right. Uh, in Russia, there has been enormous uh, uh, attention to data localization and uh, data sovereignty, internet sovereignty, which of course is not maybe may not be the most desirable outcomes, but it's really increasingly impacting also other countries. More than seventy, sorry, more than sixty countries nowadays have data localization norms since the Russian adoption of them in two thousand fifteen. In India, uh, we have a, the ongoing elaboration uh, of a new data protection law that likely will be a data governance law, and also the elaboration of a new data. Uh, empowerment and protection architecture. I will, I'm sure Mishi that will speak about this uh, in, in a couple of minutes. And in China, we will have, we have had the adoption of a new uh, Chinese civil code with the right to privacy and data protection last year, a new data protection law, a new data security law, new sectoral regulation. Uh, and so a flurry of new regulation on personal data and data in general. In South Africa, we have the entry in force of POPIA, the new data general data protection law, and the new data protection regulator that is established. Uh, Luca, Luca yes. we reached the time. I see that you listed the main developments. Maybe you can conclude with a final thought. Yes, so they, they, I will include, conclude with the increasing convergence. That is what I think the basis upon which uh, the BRICS country can develop this legal interoperability that is already going. Because if you analyze what they already have, in their frameworks, we see that we have shared pre, a shared principle basis, very similar rights that are uh, defined by the uh, adopted recently adopted law, very similar set of obligations for data controller and processors, although they are mentioned where they are labeled with different terminology. There is a very uh, convergent approach towards data transfers that are only authorized in specific circumstances. And then there is a very mounting concern regarding information security, and to some extent, this becomes digital sovereignty, uh, 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 especially with regard to China, Russia, but I, recently also uh, India and South Africa. Uh, with this, I will let the next speaker uh, enter into the topic of their choice, and i really uh, sorry if I was uh, taking too much uh, to uh, uh, deliver my presentation. Thank you. No, that's perfect. Thank you very much, Luca. Um, so I think that uh, in, the interest, in the interest of the discussion, we can keep the questions regarding this presentation uh, towards, towards the end, because we'll also have two more presentations on BRICS countries. So uh, our next speaker is the present interview, Michi Saudari. Uh, she is the only one here of the speakers that has a Wikipedia page dedicated to her. So I recommend you to go there and find more information. I used to know her as the legal director of the Software Freedom Law Center, um, and uh, but I think I see that now recently she embarked on a new role as senior vice president and general counsel of uh, VIA, which is a global data encryption and digital privacy provider uh, based in Washington DC. Uh, but she's uh, up to date with all the developments from uh, uh, India with regards to data privacy, and I think. That's what she's going to uh, enlighten us about uh, today. Uh, so, Michi, thank you very much. Uh, you have the floor. Great. Thank you. Um, Nicole, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yes, um, I uh, still serve at the Software Freedom Law Center India. And uh, in my law practice in the United States, that's the role I have changed. And mostly um, out of a desire that all the laws, policies that we actually help 
uh, enact. I think um, I also wanted to spend some time building those products which can make privacy simple and easier for everybody. Um, as we talk about these various issues, um, uh, and I think uh, both Luca and Alison talked about it, people are at the center of these discussions, not data. Um, data by itself doesn't mean much um, other than the fact that the businesses do want to monetize and the governments also want to use data for their own various purposes, sometimes um, benevolent and the other times uh, uh, nefarious as well. And um, uh, But as we put people at the center of the entire discussion, we must emphasize that um, uh, not only they need policies and the regulations and laws, but they also need products where there are choices for them and they can choose products which protects their data automatically, gives them privacy in an easy way and not an esoteric way. Luca asked me to give an update about, update about what's happening in India. Um, so India being a large democracy, uh, like everybody understands the power of data, and um, the power and money would not be uh, fighting to control it otherwise. And it's a democratic country. So the expectation is that a democratic country must prioritize people and not the monetization of data or illegitimate state action. And people expect to use technology without their legitimate activities being spied upon or their data being stolen. The country therefore needs a law that makes it simple for us to understand our own rights, not dubiously creating some burdensome bureaucracy for everyone. But um, uh, since the Supreme Court of India recognized the right to privacy as a fundamental right in the constitution, since then, all we have unfortunately heard in India is a cacophony of legislators going through the motions for years in the name of protecting people, but ultimately coming out to nothing. India does not have any data protection law at all. Um, it has been trying to work on one since 2017. There have been committees that have been appointed um, draft bills have been submitted. Then joint parliamentary committees have been appointed to examine those draft bills and the objections that have been raised by various people. And thereafter, the uh, government of India in August of this year first tried to introduce a bill, but then withdrew it and said that they would come up with a new bill, which would be uh, a completely fresh set of ideas. So we have no we have no understanding of the timeline that we are working with. It's mostly like um, Samuel Beckett's uh, Waiting for Godot, where the two main characters are engaging in a variety of discussions, waiting for the titular Godot, and it never arrives. In the same way, this is a legislation which will protect 1.3 billion people. But this legislation never seems to alive, arrive. But there are drafts available and the specter of that, which can be um, analyzed quite a bit. Um, so which tells us and gives us a little bit of an insight into what the Indian government is uh, thinking about on these issues. I will say that uh, uh, because there is no omnibus legislation that exists in India, there is also not much in terms of sectoral legislation, unlike the United States, where there is no national or omnibus legislation, but we have something in the health sector. Um, we have something in the financial sector. So I'm talking to HIP, uh, talking about HIPAA or GLBA Act, and there are various other state laws that have been enacted, whether in California or in Washington state or in various other states that, uh, that have been enact enacted. India does not even have that equivalent in various sectors. Another interesting thing in India is that um, states surveillance, which is the surveillance of communications or other things, um, that is not subject to any parliamentary or judicial oversight. 
um, the executive passes the laws and also the orders under which surveillance is carried out and executive itself is running the oversight. So there is no interference from the judiciary or the parliament on these matters. Some of you may have also noticed today's news says that Signal, the privacy protecting app is going to leave India. This is happening because in September, from September onwards, India's computer emergency response team enacted certain regulations out of their jurisdictions. And what they said that most of the cloud providers, but in particular VPN providers, they were required to collect customer information and be able to provide that data to a special government team on demand. So for five years, you are supposed to uh, collect data about people have a record of it, and then be able to share it with a government team whenever that is required. So what happened in June, NordVPN shut down its servers in India. Tunnel Bear shut down its servers in India. ExpressVPN did the same thing. And other heavyweights in the industry no longer have servers now. This kind of raises a question about uh, what is India exactly thinking about here? Um, when the Joint Parliamentary Committee examined the bill, there also um, they made certain changes. I'm sure people have at least note, noticed the fact that data sovereignty is very big in India. Um, the Reserve Bank of India, which is the central bank, they have talked about it. And um, uh, there is a lot of discussion about right to be forgotten. There's a lot of discussion about personal and non-personal data and data portability. But for everything, the government agencies get an exception. India has just decided that Pegasus never happened, although there is a lot of evidence about 110 lawyers, activists, journalists, etc., who were subjected to that surveillance. That's not happening out there. There is a discussion, as Luca was mentioning, that we want something called data empowerment and protection architecture. Now, that is supposed to say that it is going to be based on consent, but whether it is an informed consent or everybody is just forced to do it because there is otherwise no way to use those services, those principles have not been talked about at all. Like Alison was mentioning that the document did have a lot of ethics, a lot of principles based on that. We see constant random regulations coming out from different parts of the government of India, which sometimes don't even have the jurisdiction to come up with regulations without realizing or fulfilling the test which the Supreme Court of India has laid out in the KS Puttaswamy case. So unfortunately, this country has the ability to be the leader in that space, show how it can be done right, but is not on the path of perhaps uh, a rights respecting GDPR, but is trying to go on the path of more data monetization and surveillance by the state, which is uh, presented by our neighbors across the Himalayas. Nicola, I'll give you your time back. I think we are up there. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Mish, uh, for this very comprehensive update. Uh, so we see uh, there's a lot of positive things, but also some problems lurking in the background. Uh, particularly with regards to state surveillance that needs to be tackled. Uh, but let us uh, then conclude our first set of remarks and then we'll have a few minutes for questions. Um, now, our next speaker is uh, Wayne Wei Wang, uh, who is uh, uh, currently a CyberBricks fellow here at TV. Um, and he's also finishing his PhD research uh, on law and technology at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, so uh, he's also trained in engineering a lot, so he has a very uh, specific perspective on this, and uh, I, I'm looking forward to hearing his remarks. When you welcome, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Nico. Yes, but I think I'm very, I'm very happy to be invited to my data online conference uh, this year. And uh, at the uh, Nico uh, have mentioned, I was trained in engineering law, but probably I would just provide some 
uh, legal updates about uh, the Chinese uh, data governance model. Yes, as Nico has mentioned, I'm currently a physically based at uh, FGV Real Law School as a research fellow. I'm also finalizing my PhD in Rwanda Tech uh, at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, but before this, let me quickly share some slides. I'm not sure if this worked or not. Uh, let me think. Okay. Oh, anyway. That's the present to audience bottom. But is there any? Yes, but I'm already presenting anyway. Probably I will just go <laughs> yeah, because is there some privacy control in my computer? Uh huh. Probably. You wanted it now? <laughs> Joking. So uh -huh. yeah, maybe in the interest of time, you can try to go without slides. Uh yes, I'll, I'll yes to save time yes. Okay, basically, um, uh, you can understand uh, you can understand the, the data governance model in China in two aspects. The one is that you can understand uh, the model in a sense of the beyond or on the border, uh, because China. Uh, I mean, when we uh, when it comes to the border, uh, China would like to strike a balance between security and uh, innovate and uh, development. But within the border, considering the very recent uh, uh, platform governance uh, cases, for example, the DD investigation, uh, within the border, China's, uh, China's uh, data governance model is more than uh, focused, I mean, focus, it's focused more on, focused more on the uh, platform governance uh, perspective. And, uh, and the overall overarching methodology for understanding data, uh, data governance model in China is that China is, has been uh, introduced uh, introducing a data grading and a class clarification uh, uh, me mechanism. When we talk about the, uh, uh, the, the 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 data on the border, uh, the basically from the top level of uh, design of China's uh, data uh, export export uh, regulation is based on China's national security law, and uh, but it also involves some personality rights of the civil code, as uh, um, uh, Luca has mentioned. Just because I assume that a lot of audience here are from the uh, EU, so I probably we can note that the difference with the EU system is that when designing the data export. Uh, Export regulations. China first consider the protection of the national interest and the public interest, and then uh, taking into account the rights or interests of personal, uh, I mean, individuals. Uh, but the, the the core line is still uh, about the security values. Now, while um, considering the GDPR use uh, cross border data protection system, uh, probably focuses more on individual rights. Uh, and uh, if we look at the National People's Congress level legislation, there are three uh, uh, pieces of legislation. We can call them the uh, tria triaca. The first is nation, uh, cybersecurity law. The second is the data security law under the uh, very recent uh, personal information protection law. And uh, uh, there are also some supplementary norms. For example, they uh, supplement uh, there are three basically uh, approaches to um, assessing data transfer uh, outbound. The first is the security assessment. For example, China has uh, made the measures for security assessment of outbound data transfer and, uh, uh, and a gu uh, guidelines for the application for security assessment of outbound data transfer. This, these two documents are already effective. And for uh, transferring personal information, and China is currently considering introducing its own as uh, uh, SCC, the standard uh, contract cloud, uh, standard contract, uh, co st standard contracts. Yes, and uh, and another uh, way is considering doing the 
uh, a personal information protection certification. But uh, but uh, the two documents or legislation are still in the process of uh, calling for public comments. Uh, and if we consider the data within the border, um, it is also uh, no, uh, worth noting that the, emer the emer emergence of data regulations happened in accordance within the very recent tendency of the Tanmin big tax in China. However, however, narrowly speaking, the data security law itself still holds the philosophy of balancing between security and uh, development. The trade of this kind of trade of uh, uh, philosophy speeds up those local initiatives, including, for example, some localized data legislation. For example, in Shanghai and Shenzhen, we have the uh, specific local data regulations already. And China also created some data centers as computing infrastructure to support the uh, data use, uh, both in the public and private sectors. Uh, and finally, China also introduced some data exchanges locally for, for commercializing those digital assets. For example, in Beijing, there is an international data exchange, and in Shanghai and Guang, Guiyang, there are uh, their own, uh, I mean, they have their own uh, data exchanges, kind of like the data finance or something, it, it, it creates a stock marketplace uh, like. Um, uh, things for uh, commercial innovation. Yes. Okay. Uh, and finally, uh, the, we can understand that the core methodology in, in the Chinese uh, data governance is that China uh, has introduced the data grading and classification. Ch China uh, classified the data um, in, uh, by considering its importance. For example, we have the national secrets at the data. Uh, and we have the core data, what the important data and the personal data, and for for the and uh, likewise some industry specific data, uh, for example in health care or financial industry, uh, those uh, specific data are regulated by a specific uh, piece of legislation. Uh, but very recently, China introduced uh, has introduced the important data identification rules uh, uh, at the national standards. If you uh, are interested in this uh, data grading and cl classification mechanism, you can just have a look at it. Yes, considering time, I would like to save some time for our discussion. I will hand it over uh, yes. back to me. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wayne. We have a whole rich two minutes for <laughs> Q&A. Uh, I don't see any from the floor, but then I would uh, uh, take the opportunity to, to ask maybe one connecting thread between all of you, which is very close to the my data. Uh, community, which is, are you uh, positively inspired by uh, or optimistic about the uh, possibility that these new developments will encourage um, uh, technologies, the building and development of technologies that help the individuals being more in control over the personal data? And um, so uh, maybe you know we can we heard from a way about uh, you know, data exchanges being created in China. We heard from uh, Mishi about the data empowerment architecture. Uh, we heard uh, a lot about uh, a lot of initiatives that create more resiliency in the African region. So do you think that uh, there are some uh, incentives for private entities to uh, build technologies that will help individuals uh, in the implementation of this framework? Maybe we can start from the last one now. Way, uh, are you optimistic about the role of technology that we play in the next few, few years with, with that, in that regard? Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Nico, for the fantastic question. I think in China, um, there is still uh, a kind of um, tech, uh, I mean, technology solution list, uh, list um, approach to understanding uh, this, uh, to, to answering this question. Because China has been, has been investing a lot in uh, private uh, privacy computing, yes, privacy computing. They basically use some uh, 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 encryption methods to make those uh, personal data uh, unidentifiable. But I think there is still some obstacles just because the personal data can be identified uh, in a sense, right? So uh, so probably, but it's still a technology solution list in China. Yeah. Uh, let's do in one minute per speaker, or possibly a tweet uh, each. 
because uh, unfortunately we, they are pushing us out of the room. Uh, apologies for that. Maybe uh, let's follow the reverse order. So the la second last one was Mishi. Um, so I'm always optimistic because uh, what is the other choice <laughs> if you don't have optimism for future? Um, but that also means our work is cut out for us. I don't think technology can fix bad policy or bad governmental decisions. But I will say that um, technology is now beginning to think that to build pro-IT, pro-humanity IT is the right way to go. That the idea of surveillance architecture, and that's the only way to make money by collecting and monetize data, I think people are waking up to the fact that it has much more downsides, not only for our societies, our democracies, but our personal well-being as well. So um, there is a market. Um, and that's why one of the reasons I chose to work for Virtue is that uh, why don't we build these tools in an easy way? So um, I'm optimistic, but I am not uh, going to say that the developments are giving us any encouragement right now. Thank you. That's very accurate and precise. Um, so the next is uh, Luca. Yeah, I, I think I, I concur with what Michi was stating. And indeed, there is a, a clear market case to develop technology that empower users and that allow users to have to exert control on data, to enjoy informational self-determination. On the other hand, uh, it is obvious that these technologies can only thrive in an environment, in a policy environment that facilitates them and allows them, right? Uh, there is clearly some tension uh, and some countries are clearly, as Mishi was mentioning, also Wei was mentioning, uh, a little bit skeptical about this. And I think our task as researchers is to prove them wrong, to uh, to expose that actually it is beneficial both for not only for the individual but also for society at large and the economy to have more uh, transparency and trust in in uh, uh, how data are managed. And in this uh, in this perspective, I also salute the, the, the work that Alison and ICT research. Africa colleagues have been spearheading with the African frameworks. This is a very interesting work. It's it's a pity that is only so far a voluntary commitment, but it's a very interesting way of, of proceeding. Fantastic. So, Arizona, you have the last word. Thank you very much. And I, I do think the African continent free trade areas, you know, really looking at um, um, incentives on um, public policy that would enhance um, you know, alternative forms of data stewardship and um, collective rights and those kinds of things which would lend itself to these kind of technologies. But I wanted to say in the absence of some specific technology um, uh, to refer to in Africa, and I'm sure there is, it's my reflection on me that I probably can't cite it because I think there are all sorts of interesting things happening, that in the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence, the Working Group on Data Governance has three projects. One is on... Um, data trusts as in a form of alternative data stewardship and those um, documents are now public and on the web and then of course the project that we've been working on is the data justice project and there are you know um, imperatives there around looking at um, non-technology non solutions first but then also obviously using technologies where they can um, support that and then the new, newest project is actually privacy enhancing technologies um, pets and they are looking at um, you know trying to they're working with um, um, government of Singapore and private um, sector to try and develop um, privacy, enhan you know, privacy enhancing standards that could be adopted um, more broadly. Terrific. So well, with that we have a lot of uh, homeworks. Uh, there's a lot of documents that we can look at to learn more. You can also find some uh, links in the chat. Uh, to, to learn more, more about these initiatives and uh, feel free to contact uh, us and our speakers uh, if, you, if you want to learn more. Um, so I thank everybody once again for the participation and uh, I look forward to continuing our discussions in other fora and initiatives. Thanks everybody and have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.